Hello and welcome to your weekly five minutes of intercourse with Dr. Don, because we all need to talk at least a little about sex. <laughs> to begin this week's intercourse, I have a question for you. Why do babies die? Whoa, Dr. Don, that's a little too gnarly. I can't be tuning into 5MI Weekly if you're gonna be bringing me down, man. I'm sorry to begin on such a somber note this week, but you'll soon see its purpose. Think about it. What are the most likely reasons for a baby dying? What you see here are infant and under five mortality rates of countries around the world. These rates are often used as indicators of the level of health in a country. And to answer my initial question, these rates are primarily caused by three factors, medical complications, malnutrition, and neglect. This week's intercourse is rooted within neglect. You probably guess babies are most likely to die from medical or nutritional complications. But what exactly is neglect? As any dictionary will tell, to be neglected is to be ignored. So does that mean we're ignoring babies' coos and babbles? Or not replying quickly enough to their emails, Snapchats, and Facebook updates? Not quite. The truest form of neglecting a baby is not touching it. A baby's needs for touch are as great, if not more, than their needs for medical care and food. Let's revisit the infant and under five mortality rates of countries around the world. This time, I want you to find your own country of origins rates and compare that to the other countries. Bearing in mind that these mortality rates are an indicator of your country's medical accessibility, food abundance, and level of touching. For example, if we were to examine the United States, it ranks 57th mm. out of 220 countries in infant mortality rates, and 30th out of 34 countries in under five mortality rates. Despite it being the number one country in medical research and development, and the most abundant country for food exports. So if the United States is the highest ranked country for medical care and food, yet it poorly ranks in infant and child mortality rates, what does this say about the United States when it comes to neglecting its infants and children? For answers to this question, let's go back in time some 120 years and meet the man who's written the best-selling book in America on infant and child rearing. It's 1894, and Dr. Luther Emmett Holt, one of America's first and finest pediatricians, has just published his book, The Care and Feeding of Children, a Catechism for the Use of Mothers and Children's Nurses. The care and feeding of children soon becomes the standard text for child rearing in America and continues to be so for the next 50 years. In it, Holt makes clear that parents spoil their children by holding and cuddling them. Good parenting, Holt argues, is hands-off parenting. Babies under six months should never be played with, and the less of it at any time, the better for the infant. They are made nervous and irritable, sleep badly, and suffer from indigestion. By opinion and authority alone, Dr. Holt creates a near touchless society. But within just a few years, doctors across America start reporting dramatic increases in infant deaths, particularly in otherwise healthy babies. That is, babies who were getting their medical and nutritional needs met. One of those doctors was named Benjamin Spock. Like Holt, Dr. Spock was an American pediatrician, but his ideas about childcare were anything but what Holt argued. Spock argued 
parents should be flexible with their infants and children. Treat them as individuals and above all else, be affectionate with them. His book, Baby and Child Care, published in 1946, influenced infant and child rearing practices in America for the next 50 years. But like Holt, Spock based his arguments on conjecture and anecdotes and not scientific research or empirical data. The first systematic research on the effects of touching infants was performed by Austrian psychoanalyst René Spitz. In the 1940s and 50s, Spitz researched babies less than one year of age who were being raised in orphanages. And he found infant mortality rates within these orphanages to be as high as 70%. Yes, that means seven out of every 10 infants being raised in orphanages were dying before their first birthday. Before Spitz's data, it was not uncommon for other researchers to report such epidemically high infant mortality rates. However, Spitz, based upon his observations on comparing infants being raised in orphanages to infants being raised behind bars, but with their incarcerated mothers, was the first to hypothesize that these mortality rates were due to infants not being touched and had nothing to do with poor medical care or malnutrition. The scientific community was skeptical of Spitz's data and hypothesis, to the point of dismissing the idea that touch can have as much of an impact on an organism's health as medical care and food can. To address this skepticism, a biopsychologist named Harry Harlow at the University of Wisconsin designed a scientific experiment to test Spitz's hypothesis. Harlow's experiment had rhesus monkeys acting as the participants. Shortly after their birth, Harlow deprived these monkeys of their mother's touch for as long as one year. If Spitz's hypothesis was correct, then the lack of the mother's touch would have negative effects on the monkey's development, even though these monkeys otherwise received proper medical care and were well fed. What did Harlow find? When compared to being raised by their mothers, rhesus monkeys raised without their mothers, analogous to infants being raised within orphanages, had higher mortality rates. And if they did survive, they had significant physical deficits, like being sicklier and smaller in stature, and psychological deficits, like not being able to incorporate new objects into their environment, and they had significantly lower psychosocial skills. Specifically, Harlow stated, monkeys that physically survived exhibited autistic-like behaviors and were unable to form intimate pair bondings, which he argued is the basis of love. Now, why won't he go to her? Because he has no real affection for her. That convulsive, rocking, jerking motion is called autistic behavior by psychiatrists, and is also characteristic of human infants deprived of affection. Spitz's hypothesis about touch being a requirement for life now had scientific proof. And upon further experiments using surrogate mothers composed of a soft terry cloth, Harlow found normal physical and psychological development is less about a mother's touch per se and more about a contact comfort touch. A contact comfort touch is a soft, warm and yielding touch. Anyone, repeat anyone, can give contact comfort touches. They're typically skin to skin touches and often occur when we're caressing or massaging one another. The prototypical contact comfort touch occurs between a mother and an infant 
during breastfeeding. It's always been assumed the benefits of breastfeeding are solely due to the breast milk itself. But now we're starting to believe these benefits are not only due to the chemistry of the breast milk, but also due to the contact comfort touches occurring during breastfeeding. After all, one generally does not breastfeed their baby like this. Instead, mothers tend to breastfeed their babies like this. Asian countries have known about the benefits of touching their infants a bit longer than us in the United States have. China has been massaging their infants for more than 2,200 years. And countries like India, Nepal, and Bangladesh have been systematically massaging their infants since their country's inceptions. Standing upon this ancient Asian perspective and Harlow's initial empirical data, the most advanced and cutting edge medical centers today have birthing plans that systematically incorporate touching between mothers and infants as soon as the babies are born. There appears to be a critical period between birth and about two years of age in which contact comfort touches have the greatest physical and psychosocial benefits on the developing human. This is not to say that we should stop touching one another after two years of age, but we do know that contact comfort touches during these first two years of life are associated with healthy weight and height gains, sleep-wake patterns, motor development, emotional bonding, and lower mortality rates, which officially brings us full circle back to infant mortality rates. We know historically, scientifically, culturally, and intuitively, touch is life. Beyond the cutting edge medical centers, what are we, you and I, doing with all this knowledge about the significance of touch? Well, we're growing physically further apart from one another and touching one another less than we ever have in our recorded history. Why are we doing this? Because, because humans, humans are, are stupid. stupid! Okay, Scary Panda, that might be one reason, but I'm sure there are a lot of other reasons as well. Technology, jobs, the internet, a changing economy. But whatever the reasons may be, there is a simple solution. Reach out and touch someone, whether it be your family, your friends, or accepting strangers, and do this systematically now because if we do not history is clear in showing us the biological psychological and sociological ramifications increases in sickness disease and death decreases in intimacy learning and life satisfaction and psychosocial disconnections dichotomous discourses poverty and violence. Let me end this week's intercourse with a promise and a question. With touch being the basis of our lives, I promise to be revisiting touch in the coming months. And we'll look at touch and its effects on love, happiness, and communication throughout our lifespans. But before I do any of this, let me ask you a question. Starting today, how are you going to incorporate more touching into your own life? Thanks for watching. If you could rate this video, I'd appreciate it. Like us on Facebook at 5MI Weekly and follow us on Twitter. If you have suggestions about intercourse topics, then leave your ideas in the comment section or send those suggestions on Twitter to 5MI underscore weekly using the hashtag 5MI topics. If I use your ideas for an intercourse, then I promise I'll be sending you a free copy of Being, my book on happiness.